Hello everyone, uh, my name is Darcy and I'm a PhD candidate from Deakin Uni and yeah, tonight I'm talking about advancing uh, mammal conservation in the, in the face of fire and invasive predators. So first of all, I would like to give you the essential but undeniably miserable background um, context for my project. So miserableness is kind of hard to escape in conservation ecology I've been learning um, over the years. Uh, now, Australia has the worst modern mammal uh, extinction rate in the world, boasting 35% of all mammal extinctions uh, over the sort of past 500 years or so. That represents about 30 species that we've lost. Uh, now, the invasive red cat, uh, uh, red fox and, and feral cat are two major contributors to this uh, miserable record. Each year in Australia, they kill an estimated 1.4 billion native animals and they've contributed to 28 of uh, those 30 extinctions. Now, fire is a really important ecological disturbance across most of the country. However, fire regimes, and that simply means the timing, location, and severity of fire events, um, have changed a lot since European invasion um, for a whole host of reasons. And now inappropriate fire regimes uh, threaten about 88% of Australia's land mammals. So there's growing concern that the threats of fire and invasive predators might actually be interacting with one another and this might be leading to even worse outcomes for some of Australia's native mammals. And the potential mechanism behind this interaction is fairly straightforward. So feral cats and foxes are really terrific hunters, uh, but they, could be more, they can find it more difficult to detect and catch prey in really complex environments, you know, like dense vegetation. And fire, of course, consumes that understory vegetation and simplifies the habitat. And so cat and fox activity can increase then in burnt landscapes, likely because their hunting success is improved in the simplified habitat. You know, it's easier for them to see and catch prey. And the strongest evidence for this interaction comes from a series of studies from tropical northern Australia about a decade ago. And since then, there's been several studies from different ecosystems across the country testing this idea, um, but they've kind of found varying results. So it's unclear at the moment whether increased cat and fox activity in response to fire is a general phenomenon that kind of you know, happens more or less after every fire, or whether the responses are more context specific and, and not really generalizable. So the first of my two PhD aims was to better understand how cats and foxes respond to fire, uh, because this is of course critical for developing effective management strategies. Now, as ever, a good way to better understand a phenomenon is to review the literature and do some meta-analysis. So that's what we did. And we looked, and anal looked at and analysed all of the studies that have uh, looked at the changes in cat and fox activity uh, in response to fire across the country. Now, the key finding from this study was that there was no widespread evidence of cats and foxes consistently uh, increasing their activity in response to fire. However, uh, when in increases did occur, they were more likely to happen shortly after fire. So, uh, for instance, the probability of detecting cat activity or increased cat activity was 41% at zero months post-fire, and this decreased down to 10% at 100 months post-fire. For foxes, the probability dropped from 53% down to 10%. So further studies are needed to help grow this knowledge base, particularly those that begin sh sampling shortly after fire, you know, ideally within a few days or a week or two, and particularly in temperate forest ecosystems because there's still a real dearth of data from these regions. Okay, so that brings uh, me to paper number two where we experimentally tested how cat and fox activity changed uh, in response to prescribed fire in a temperate ecosystem. So the background image here is my lovely study region um, the Eastern Otway Ranges just behind Anglesey and Aries Inlet. And here we set up a camera trap grid comprising 30 camera traps ahead of a planned burn all the way back in 2019. And I realise that some of you may not know what camera traps are, but they're these motion sensor camera traps, of, you know, motion sensor traps um, that we use to survey animal activity, and they can be left in situ for several weeks or sometimes several months. And I use uh, tuna oil as a lure to bring nearby animals into the frame of the camera to increase my ability to detect them. And we surveyed my sites at six months and two months before the fire, and then again at two weeks, three months, and six months after the fire. And the key finding from this paper uh, was that we found no response of cats to the prescribed fire at all. Meanwhile, fox activity was higher after the fire, but this was across both the burnt and the unburnt sites. 
So due to the proximity of our um, control and treatment sites, I'm not actually sure if it was the fire that drove this change. It could have been another mechanism like uh, potentially juvenile foxes, which disperse at this time of year. Um, yeah, unfortunately, there's a little bit of uncertainty surrounding that result. Now, whilst this experiment provides further evidence that cats and foxes don't always uh, increase in response to fire, which is valuable, we do know that this interaction does happen and land managers need effective management options to reduce the impacts of cats and foxes after fire. And the most common uh, approach that land managers use is lethal control, like trapping and poison baiting, but there are a whole host of restrictions around when and where this can be done, especially in Victoria. And successful outcomes can be difficult to achieve in open environments where there's continual migration um, of animals into the area that you're trying to manage. So one potential option that's been gaining quite a lot of interest uh, in recent years is to deploy artificial refuges for ground-dwelling animals um, uh, immediately after a fire. And so the, the idea here is that they could provide shelter from predators and improve the persistence of small animals until the vegetation regrows. Now, everyone's probably familiar with the concept of nest boxes for bats and birds and possums. This is a broadly similar concept, except it's for ground-dwelling animals. So the second aim of my PhD was to test the efficacy of an artificial refuge design for improving mammal persistence after fire. To address this, we initially conducted two reviews on artificial refuges and looked at why and how they've been used all around the world um, to learn more about their effectiveness and their shortcomings. And the key takeaway from this research was that only 39% of artificial refuge studies used experimental controls and less than 10 used a backy design or before-after control impact design. So as a consequence, very few studies um, can actually confidently determine uh, the overall effect that they're having on their target species and populations. And so this is really important because the use of artificial refuges is a strategy that really readily garners a lot of positive media attention because it's sort of a direct and tangible action that you can take in time of a crisis. And then it can also um, really engage the community as well. But in many instances, it's still unclear whether artificial refuges are actually effective or they're just a well-intentioned but sort of ultimately ineffective action that kind of wastes a lot of time and money. And some refuges can even have a detrimental impact on the target species in what we call an ecological trap. So I wanted to learn from the findings of these reviews and make sure that I gain really robust insights into the efficacy of my artificial refuge uh, to sort of best inform land managers. So to do this, I undertook three experiments. The first two uh, looked at the behavioural responses of native fauna, uh, fauna in terms of activity patterns uh, to the refuges after fire. Now, the background image I use for these slides is a photo of one of my refuges. They were 50 metres long, are made from chicken wire and covered in shade cloth, and I built five of them at each one of my sites, and they kind of were parallel with each other, about 10 or 15 metres apart. And there were no larger openings in these refuges, so only um, animals that could fit through the five centimetre gaps in the wire could enter, and they could enter and exit from any point, so their behaviour, in theory, didn't become predictable to predators. And to put it mildly, they were absolutely hell to install. <laughs> uh, but I had a really great team of volunteers helping me out. And so we did a control impact study in the Otway Ranges, as well as on Kangaroo Island and in the Simpson Desert. And we built a total of 76 of these bad boys um, across these three sites, which is over three and a half kilometres of chicken wire. Uh, and we found that activity was much higher inside the refuges for a breadth of species, particularly the painted button quail, like this cute little family having a stomp inside one. Um, but also for superb fairy wrens, um, scrub wrens and heath wrens, and the small skinks. In contrast, uh, small mammals showed mixed responses with about two thirds of small mammal species showing no response compared to the controls. However, the kangaroo island dunnart and the bush rat both had positive responses and that was really great because um, the refuges were built on kangaroo island specifically for the dunnart, which is a critically endangered animal that had most of its range obliterated in the fires. So that was a really good outcome. Now, animals also spent more time per visit inside the refuges. Uh, so small mammals spent up to 40, an average of 43 seconds in the refuges compared to eight seconds at the control sites. Um, for birds, it's just 20 seconds compared to 13 seconds. And small skinks doubled their time inside the refuges, uh, two seconds to one second. Now, so taken together, these results suggest that the refuges are reducing the perceived risk of predation um, for small fauna, which is really great. But to understand if these trends in activity um, based data actually translate to improved population persistence, uh, we need studies that test 
um, population metrics like survival or abundance or what have you. And so that's what I did in my final study where I conducted another experiment using a prescribed fire, again in the Otway ranges. And this little guy here is an agile antikinus, some of you may be familiar with. In my opinion, I think these are the best small mammals in the Victoria, and if anyone wants to argue about that, <laughs> bring it on. Um, so I had three treatments uh, sites which remained unburnt throughout, burnt sites without artificial refuges and then burnt sites with artificial refuges. And I surveyed small mammals across these sites um, over, so over 12 months, uh, twice before the fire and again three times after the fire. And we wanted to know how the refuges um, influenced the abundance of two of the most common species at my sites, bush rats and the agile antichinus, as well as overall small mammal species diversity. What did I find? Well, unfortunately, no effect of the artificial refuges, alas. Um, so despite my previous experiments, which show small mammals will spend more time per visit inside the refuges and some species like the bush rat, um, you know, really favoured them, these findings are suggesting that the refuges don't actually improve the population persistence, which is kind of you know, the key metric. And so at this point, I don't believe that we should sort of scale up um, the application of this management technique. However, large scale field experiments like this are inherently context dependent and exceedingly difficult to control. You know, that's kind of the beauty and the curse of ecology. And uh, this is because there's a whole host of variables like fire size and fire severity, prey abundance and activity, prey population dynamics, um, and other variables will, will no doubt vary between my study and say another study that's undertaken in the forests of New South Wales um, in a completely different forest type, for example. So I'm still encouraging researchers, sorry, I still encouraging researchers to undertake further experiments with artificial refuges after fire, including with alternative res refuge designs and following severe fire when there's less vegetation remaining in the system. And yeah, that is it. I'd like to give a big thank you to my amazing um, team of supervisors, the many external collaborators that I worked with, also the many generous funders, and of uh, course the um, yeah my amazing team of volunteers and my study animals. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Thank you.